Gotha 101. Welcome to Gotha 101. I am Dr. Sanders. Now, you may be saying to yourself, what the heck is Gotha 101? Is that some kind of crazy cooking show about numbers and goth things? That would be awesome, but no, it is not. <laughs> this is going to be a new series in which I focus on the history of a lot of our favorite goth bands and bands I find historically significant or ones I just find interesting. Basically, I'm going to take a look at each album released by the artist and give my own opinions of that record, see if I like it or not, if it, you know, why I would enjoy it. But I want to kind of go into the background of some of the bands that I think need a little bit more attention in today's modern world. Give you all the information you might need to explore the band yourself. You know, if you're saying, well, I have this idea about Bauhaus and this album didn't really do it for me. And, you know, maybe there's no one out there that you don't even know exists that might pertain to you. But yes, the first band we're going to cover is going to be Bauhaus, the classic, absolutely awesome band. This, <laughs> obviously not all albums pictured here, but an amazing, amazing group that actually right now, I believe, is still touring, which is kind of cool, at least at the time of filming this, but it has a very long, kind of crazy history. And uh, yeah, let's just get into it. And I gotta say, if you're looking for a show where they just say, oh, here's this album, it's classic, so it's good automatically, I like it, that's it, it's probably not the show for you. I will be going into my own opinions on these records and Yes, a lot of them are extremely classic, and they do have a lot of good songs. But yeah, remember, sometimes just because an album is a classic album doesn't mean it appeals to someone's taste. So if I happen to really like an album that you don't like or really dislike an album that you really enjoy, that's okay. Kind of the purpose of this is to go through some of the history and give you my own opinions on these albums and then kind of tell you about the band so you can make your own decisions about it. So let's get into it. First episode, Goth 101, Bauhaus. But first, let me talk about my sponsor. I don't have one. So if you want to support me in any way, you can check out my band down below. Play kind of like a surreal alternative rock kind of thing. Got some punk and goth tones in there. It's called Dr. Sanders. So check that out below because that's the stuff I work on outside of these videos. Woo, okay. Bauhaus was formed in 1978 in the town of Northampton. The members consisted of Peter Murphy on vocals, and various instruments throughout the years. Daniel Ash on guitar, David J on bass, and Kevin Haskins on drums. Surprisingly, this original lineup would remain together even every reunion over the decades. Guitarist Daniel Ash and brothers David and Kevin Haskins have played in several bands since childhood. But after the demise of their most recent group, Ash asked his school friend, Peter Murphy, to front the group. Having no musical experience, he reluctantly agreed. Ash was wary of bringing David J in due to wanting full control of the project, but of course he eventually relented. The band's original name was Bauhaus 1919 and was named after the art and design movement that began in that same year, although they dropped the numbers shortly after forming. The group is well known for their dark atmospheric sound and look, but the band has evolved and incorporated many different styles into their releases. In fact, many people cite the band as the first genuine goth rock band. Whereas artists like Susie and the Banshees and The Cure evolved into their dark sound, Bauhaus embraced the darkness straight out of the gate. Debut single Bella Lugosi's Dead was recorded with a series of other songs when the group was only together for six weeks. The title track became extremely influential in goth music as people would come to know it. At over nine minutes long, with a huge buildup and spooky lyrics incorporating Dracula actor Bela Lugosi, the single evolves the popular sound of post-punk with a mesmerizing rhythm track that sounds like something straight out of a suspenseful horror movie. Ash's jangly guitar increases the track's intensity with Murphy's vocals building into a fiery crescendo as he belts out, undead, undead, Undead. It's almost always mentioned in lists of the Top Goth songs. The singles release also includes the great song Boys and the hidden demo for the song Double Dare that we'll, we'll see a little bit of later. The band had a bit of trouble getting the single released and eventually made an agreement with Small Wonder Records. It became the band's first hit and would stay on the indie charts for over two years. 
Luckily, it gained enough traction for the band to release their next three singles on the new 4AD label. At the time, the label was called Axis, before discovering there was already a label by that name. Uh, common problem, actually, surprisingly. Dark Entries, Terror Couple Kill Colonel, cool name, and a cover of T-Rex's Telegram Sam helped lay the groundwork for what would become their debut album. It is all energetic, hard-hitting goth rock. In the Flatfield, the band's first full length, would be released in 1980. And while many critics didn't seem to enjoy it, at least at the time, it connected with the public and even entered the British pop charts. The now iconic cover of a naked guy playing a trumpet or something was taken by photographer Dwayne Mickles, I believe that's how you say it, in 1949, titled, I'm gonna butcher this, Homage to Povis de Chavannes. Probably not at all how you pronounce that. It's probably the most famous album with full frontal male nudity. At least that I'm familiar with. The music itself is a barrage of aggressive atmospheric goth rock, distorted bass lines, aggressive guitars, and pounding drums, along with crazy vocals. This compromises the nine tracks that have an almost timeless quality to them. Don't be fooled either. It's not just a sound reminiscent of punk. There's some weird saxophone, and a healthy dose of groove on the song Dive. A number of songs have Ash using a very dry guitar tone, while Murphy's voice creates a journey through some crazy noisecape. I also want to note on the band's appearance, like the way they looked. Bauhaus came into existence before the era of MTV. No multi-million dollar music videos. There was Top of the Pops, The Old Grey Whistle Test, magazines, fan clubs, things like that not quite on the scale that music would rise to in the latter part of the decade. Their shows were full of energy, with Murphy writhing erratically around the stage, and their fashion sense was often described as a gothic glam combo. The way they presented themselves still influences goth fashion today as we know it. To me, this album feels like a bunch of art students getting together to create one giant collaborative piece. Songs like The Spy and the Cab, and Small Talk Stinks sounds so experimental. Stigmata Martyr has Murphy singing in Latin, saying, in the name of Father and of Son and of Spirit Holy. Even most music classified as goth after this point wouldn't venture in some of its more radical directions. For an album released in 1980, the production and ideas hold up, really. I mean, it's not always to my particular taste, mostly because the guitar tones can be hit or miss to my particular ears, but the production and energy of this one have made it a bona fide classic. Also, I want to remind people that Bella Lugosi's Dead is not on this album. It's a single that was released separately, and it was included on later compilation albums. That was just a personal nitpick. Right around the time of the album's release, they released a video for their cover of Telegram Sam. It has the band playing in an abandoned factory with Peter Murphy acting like a deranged mime with some sweet moves. David J ready for his office job, Daniel Ash feeling his guitar, and Haskins looking like a greaser. It's a short, but great one. In 1981, just one year later, the band would release their sophomore album, Mask. Whew, it's a good one. The band developed their sound quite a bit in just a year and made quite a number of amazing songs. The band's success actually had them moving to 4AD's parent label, Beggar's Banquet, for this one. The band seemed to have a better grasp on melodies and while still keeping a strong energetic pace in many songs. They're able to tackle slower tracks like Hollow Hills. Some of the highlights are the singles, The Passion of Lovers and Kick in the Eye. Ooh, both of which are so insanely catchy and highlight the band's ability to combine different genres into their own darker glam rock sound. It's like listening to David Bowie at nighttime. So many other groups that would later adopt the goth tag would probably never dream of creating a song like In Fear of Fear, but it just works for them so well. Now, I personally 
prefer the sound of Mask over in the flat field. The sound seems more cohesive, and the addition of keyboards, acoustic guitars, and different guitar effects really make it a fun record. The decision to add in a few funkier songs, along with darker tracks like The Man with X-Ray Eyes and the title track, it's just a great move. The album art is another story. Uh, drawn by Ash, it's a... Uh, it's very unique. I know it's considered a classic cover in its own way, but I have never connected with it. The Gatefold actually shows more of the drawing, but the panda, angry robot, and staring guy, uh, it's, it's just confusing to me. I just, I just can never pair that art with the music on that platter. I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. But, uh, I don't know. You know, it's probably somebody's favorite album cover, I'm sure. A second music video was made for the song Mask, which is a trippy, dark, surreal horror type thing. The band wanders around in a creepy abandoned building and forest before each band member tries to revive an ash-covered Murphy who is asleep on some wooden pallets. David J falls down and Peter now has a weird harness or something on his face. At the end, he reappears on the pallets to, I guess, be revived once again. To me, Bauhaus's music videos always showed that they were more of an artist type of group than a bunch of partiers. High concept with uh, some interesting results. This was made the same year MTV debuted, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't in rotation on the network. The sound of the drum. Again, just one year later, in 1982, they released The Sky's Gone Out. Three albums, three years. Three. This record has many of the same great things we've seen so far, but has a darker overall tone. The production takes another leap with bigger sounding tracks like Silent Hedges and Spirit, while still offering overt aggression. With the opener, a cover of Brian Eno's Third Uncle. The instrumentation and vocals are still great, with the approach to songwriting almost seeming like a mashup of both Mask and In the Flat Field. Songs like In the Night have a heavy post-punk feel, but The Three Shadows Part 1 and the almost six minutes Swing the Heartache are experimental concoctions of noise. The highlights for many are Spirit and All We Ever Wanted Was Everything the latter of which became the band's signature ballad. Exquisite Corpse actually has all three members contributing vocals before a song abruptly turns into a reggae track. <laughs> it's just, it's very interesting. Only Bauhaus could do that kind of thing, I guess. Uh, but what a way to end a record. <laughs> Honestly, this feels a lot less cohesive than the previous record. Um, as many of us have stated, it feels like a few really focused songs and some unfinished ideas. Still, I mean, it's very good. Of course, I mean, it's Bauhaus for right here. It's really good. And the standout tracks are just amazing. But it may have needed a little more time to sound as tight as the previous visions that they had with the In the Flat Field of Mask. The cover art, again, was handled by Daniel Ash. And this time, I really enjoy it. It sort of looks like an eye with some trees growing on the perimeter of it. What's weird is that the Canadian art is just like all white. It's just like a white record and like as has the title. It's, it's really strange. A music video was made for Spirit <laughs> with the band playing a theater hall of well um spirits. Uh, there are creepy clowns and disappearing people watching the group. Uh, Haskins has a really weird drum kit for some reason with all these crazy cymbal stands. Uh, that, that's not normal. Ash plays his guitar with a drumstick before the spirits join the band on stage. It's a, it's honestly classic. I mean, it's as, it's as amazing as the album art, believe me. <laughs> the same year, Bauhaus covered David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust for a BBC session. Now this one peaked at number 15 on the British charts and it aided the band's back catalog of material. Especially Sky's Gone Out, which I guess was, you know, maybe not doing quite as well as they had expected. But it's a pretty straightforward cover of the track from the 1972 album Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, but it's a little heavier and has a bit more of a bombastic 80s feel to it. 
the Bauhaus version was released with a really cool cover evocative of the Aladdin Sane album art and it included their third uncle cover so you got a single that has two covers on it which is kind of cool they even got to appear on top of the pops to promote this particular amazing cover and they made another music video for this one Peter Murphy's locked in a cage for being too spooky while a number of Bauhaus fans walk down long brick corridors and avoid letting him out the band plays a show for the fans that ignored him earlier and uh, they all lose their effing minds. David J is in his usual suit while Murphy and Ash embrace the goth fishnet look. I'm pretty sure everyone has just ripped off this particular look at this point from this music video. But uh, Murphy jumps in the crowds and then all of a sudden he's uh, wrapped up in a sheet or body bag type thing while the audience shuffles him away. It is uh, truly amazing and I'm pretty sure one of the most watched goth music videos of the 80s. Got some uh, competition there. Some Sister Mercy stuff, you know, this corrosion. To round out the year, a live album titled Press the Eject and Give Me the Tape was released that compiled performances from two shows. It's an interesting one, although some uh, pressings of the record have a somewhat scratchy sound and I'm not sure if it's an issue with something in the mixing process or the mastering or just even the versions I've listened to, but uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of strange for me. Uh, also, David J's bass seems to be out of tune which is most obvious on Kick in the Eye and In Fear of Fear, like the heavy bass songs. It sounds out of tune to me as a musician. That, uh, you know, not a big deal, but I thought I'd mention it. It's, a, it's an interesting snapshot of the band, but uh, later live releases are objectively better than this one. All this one's, I mean, it's kind of considered a classic live album, but for my personal taste, I just, uh, I, I don't put this one on. I gotta be honest. <laughs> In 1983, as the band star was rising, Murphy capitalized on his looks by appearing in ads for the tech company Maxell, promoting their cassettes. I really should run out and get a few of those. <laughs> Great sound, right? The group also appeared in the vampire movie The Hunger, which just so happened to star David Bowie. It's directed by Tony Scott, who also directed Top Gun and Beverly Hills Cop 2. Great movies, by the way. It's a crazy film about vampirism that probably needed some more Bowie in it. <laughs> but the opening with Bauhaus playing Bella goes he's dead in a smoking club as the main characters suck blood from their victim's neck is like the highest goth achievement on film. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> the band doesn't appear in the rest of the film, sadly, but that moment really sets the tone. In fact, it's, it's hard to live up to actually after that part of the movie. In fact, that was one of the issues that the band barely appears, right? It's mostly Peter Murphy, uh, you know, and uh, everyone else gets like a little cameo with the majority of the focus being on just Peter writhing across the cage and everything. So, uh, yeah, it was apparently a, a little bit of a sore spot. Uh, all this extra attention on the singer led to a growing tension within the band. And Peter himself later admitted that the attention uh, kind of went to his head. He said, my state was so confused. I'd be absorbed so much allowing myself to be taken with fame and the idea of what we were i became obsessed with it going into the recording of their final album of the 80s burning from the inside the band was unfortunately in disarray the infighting and disputes over songwriting led to them almost calling it day before the group recorded a single note, but they agreed to go forward to obtain an advance from their label. Yeah, money, right? Uh, just before heading into the studio, Murphy contracted a bad case of pneumonia and had to be hospitalized. He presumed the band would uh, pause the sessions and wait until he recovered, but uh, later received a phone call that they were making progress on the record. Uh, when the singer did return, he discovered several songs already tracked with vocals which uh, only irritated him more. Uh, they surprisingly made it through the recording process, but uh, Murphy has stated in you know later interviews that he doesn't consider it to be a true Bauhaus album. Burning from the Inside, musically speaking, is a bit disjointed, like the sky's gone out, but overall, I prefer the songs here. I mean, opening with the goth anthem, She's in Parties, the dark moody guitar, an active bass line combined with the eerie backup vocals 
get the album off to a monumental start. I mean, this thing is just classic. The full version has another great reggae part, and I mean, man, this thing is played everywhere in goth clubs all over the world. Uh, just totally amazing. Uh, the tracks that follow show a ton of variety, especially with both David J and Daniel handling quite a bit more vocals. Uh, when Murphy takes a seat, he still delivers his trademark fiery spit takes, uh, but you also get songs like King Volcano and Hope, which just have very odd structures. They just sound very unique, uh, let alone the piano filled Who Killed Mr. Moonlight, which later became the title of David J's biography. I really enjoy the instrumentation of this album. The guitar has a very haunting sound to it. It does sound more polished in terms of production, but Antonin Artad, I think that's how you say that, shows that the group still knew how to get down and dirty. A final music video was produced for She's in Parties with a band playing in another abandoned building. Peter Murphy goes to drink his tea, but then decides he doesn't want it. There's a soldier making sure the band keeps playing the songs. It's so cold that you can see the breath. There's shots of fishnet gloves, and the guard eventually gets in the car and drives the band away or something. The final shot shows a copy of In the Flat Field lying on the ground next to a copy of the She's in Party single. But what's strange is the album art is actually different as the image shown on it is actually the label on the vinyl single. So it's like it was like an alternate cover for the She's in Party single that I, I haven't seen. So that's pretty cool little fact. Just right at the end you'll see it. The album will be released a week after the band played their farewell show at the Hammersmith Palai on July 5th, 1983. It actually sold better than Scott's Gone Out, but some attribute that to the buzz around the breakup. But uh, yeah, it's still an amazing, amazing record, and one I highly recommend. Post-breakup, a slew of great releases would appear from members of the band from a number of different projects, but the two most famous would be Love and Rockets and Peter Murphy's solo work. Love and Rockets is essentially the members of Bauhaus uh, sans Murphy. And Murphy's solo work would enlist a number of players over the years, some of them absolutely awesome. But the members would separately discuss the band for years after. But no new plans would surface until uh, over a decade had passed. Fans could at least enjoy the band on video when the VHS releases of Shadow of Light and Archive hit the stores. Shadow of Light being a compilation of their music videos and some performances from their appearance at the Old Vic Theater in 1982. Some of the audio previously released on Press the Eject and Give Me the Tape, but I, I like the mixes here better. I don't know if there's some something they did here, but uh, yeah. Archive, the other release, is more of a concert film using more footage from the Old Vic show. And in between each song, there's a story of an elderly man running from some people he came across at a pub before finding an old projector that just so happens to have this concert on it. He eventually disappears as the film ends. It's kind of weird, but of course the music is great. Over the years, the band would become influential to a number of artists who would appeal to mainstream audiences, and the questions of reunion began to stir louder and louder until 1998, when it finally happened. With the rise in interest of industrial and goth influenced bands hitting an all time high in the mid to late 90s, it's no surprise that the tour was a smash hit. I was 12 years old when they broke up. I couldn't believe they were together. It's awesome. We're a lot younger, so we didn't ever get to see them and everything, so this is like a great opportunity for us. It continued for several months, and we even got a great live album titled Gotham, released in 1999. It was recorded in New York City in 1998 and even included the band covering Dead Can Dance's Severance. We also got one new song titled The Dogs of Vapor on the Heavy Metal 2000 film soundtrack. You know, I've never seen that movie, but uh, maybe I gotta check it out now. Apparently there were plans to write a new record, but uh, they quickly fell apart. A second reunion took place in 2005 at the gigantic music festival Coachella, where Peter saying Bella Lugosi's dead while suspended upside down. Really, I mean, it's real, it's crazy. Uh, they toured into 2006 and hinted at some new music, but uh, 
it would take a few more years to surface. Go away, white. Go away, white. But finally, in 2008, after 25 years, the band released Go Away White. They did so with no promotional tour and announced that it would be the final Bauhaus album while deciding not to work with each other again. It's like all that press release right, at the same time. Now, they were open about how difficult it ended up being to work with one another in the studio after all those years. Recording in a little over two weeks with very little development past the first takes of songs. The band hoped to revisit and flush out the recordings at a later date, but uh, this never happened. The available material was edited into what we have today. The cover is an overexposed photo of the Bethesda Terrace. It's okay, but I'd be lying if I said I liked it as much as the previous ones, especially like this guy's gone out and stuff. You know, the band just couldn't get along. <laughs> and you can see their interviews for who they think might have been the uh, cause of that particular uh, falling apart. But, uh, you know. Honestly, I could say that just like the cover, um, I feel the same way about the music. Uh, I know I'm not the first person to say this, but this release does feel unfinished compared to the rest of their discography. Uh, it's definitely not bad as the cumulative talent here. It does shine through, but I feel like they could have done more with some of these songs. Actually, <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> My main complaint uh, is the repetition of riffs and hooks. It does feel spontaneous in a way, but this is a band who had already excelled at capturing lightning in a bottle for several albums and has already demonstrated so much energy. I don't mean to completely dismiss this release, but uh, sonically and structurally, I find uh, a lot more enjoyment from the 80s records. So Love and Rockets releases and uh, Murphy's solo records, uh, which pains me to say, it, uh, it's awful. But if you happen to enjoy it, then that's great. But outside of a few moments like Undone or Blackstone Heart, it just doesn't hold my attention. I mean, it's it's disappointing. So the band went back to releasing solo albums and working on different projects until late 2019, when it was announced that the original lineup would come together once again to tour. It was delayed due to a number of issues. Uh, some you could probably guess, uh, actually also some health issues. Um, but. As of saying these words, the tour is still continuing. Still no new songs, but uh, any Bauhaus is appreciated. Of course, as I was editing this video, Bauhaus, after over a decade, decided to release a new song, which is just my luck with these kind of things. But they released a new song called Drink the New Wine, and it is awesome. I like it. It's on the more surreal side of Bauhaus, and... I wish that Go Away White was more of this kind of material, but let's hope for a new record. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Well, that's it so far. Uh, <laughs> but let's quickly go over my live album recommendations because uh, there's a number of them that have been released, uh, especially after the band broke up. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna give my quick guide for this. So rest in peace, the final concert. It recorded their final show of the 80s. It's a great set list. It's a horrible recording. Uh, the quality's terrible, uh, so fans only on that one. You gotta really be into it. Uh, live in Studio 1979, it's essentially a giant rehearsal of their early material. Um, like I think it's even before the first album, so it's just it's interesting to hear them so rough. But again, mixing quality is it's not great, so probably again fans only. Uh, Gotham, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Five bats. Five bats out of five. Uh, this is for when it captures a show from 1981. It's amazing. Sounds great. Performs to strong. Totally recommended. Might be my favorite. Five bats. Ten bats. Whatever. That's it. That's all of the Bauhaus things I'm going to talk about here today. I may cover some other stuff in the future, but hopefully that gives you some knowledge about the band and kind of get you into the mood to hear one of the first goth bands are one of the first well you heard what i said so hopefully you've enjoyed this one you have learned something you found it interesting let me know what bands you want me to cover on goth 101 because uh 
yeah, it's a lot of fun <laughs> digging up some of these old magazines and different stuff to cover. But uh, I love hearing this music and listening to it in depth. I just like share my opinion and all that stuff. And hopefully I wasn't too hard on some album that defined your life and you thought was amazing and you're surprised I hate. But knowing my opinion on some of these records, that probably happened to at least one of you. So again, you can enjoy, subscribe, like, follow me, all these things. And uh, make sure you stay spooky. I'm very glad that this video is done being edited as I'm looking at it. it. Took many, many hours. I put some of the sources and some of the places I got some of my information and different fan photos from over the years below if you want to check those out. I tried to credit everything where I could that wasn't obvious. Uh, just in case I missed something, let me know. But I also used the book Dark Entries Bauhaus and Beyond, which was like a really old biography of the band but there was some great information in there it took a long time to compile all this together so yeah i hope you enjoyed it